Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy is uh he's not here uh because it's his mother-in-law's funeral. But we have a very special guest in the building. Today is the day her book has finally hit the ecosystem. Finally. Queen Tamika D. Mallory, State of Emergency, How to Win in the Country We Built. How are you, Queen I'm Mallory? Doing well, we've worked hard on this project. Your first book. Yeah, the first book on uh my, my book imprint, Black Privilege Publishing. I'm I'm I'm, I'm ecstatic that it's you. I'm yeah. ecstatic that your story gets to be told. And it just feels like now is the right time. I think people got Tamika Mallory fucked up. Uh, well, c- clearly. <laughs> I mean, that's a fact. But yeah, but it's it's actually really good. And I was uh, I did a speech a couple Sunday, just this past Sunday, at uh, Jamal Bryant's church in, in New Birth in Atlanta. And I was talking about the forward, which we'll talk about later, and how it's a conversation, which is not the typical way that forwards are done. Mm-hmm. I said, but because a black man owns the publishing company and a black woman wrote the book, we made the decision. That's right. 100%. That's what I like. 100%. But congrats, Tamika. And, Thank you know, you. you're so humble all the time. And you even had a problem saying this is your book. Yeah. It did. You know, I'm just, I just always have been a we, us, our person. I think that has actually, ta- you know, it's been the thing to help me go far in life. And I want to remain that way. And so, yeah, I like the idea that this is our book because it's our work. And it, I can't do it by myself. What, what kind of, what kind of label was this? Was it a label of love? Was it a label of hurt? Or was it just labor to write this book? Uh, it was labor of love and mm-hmm. pain. Um, you know, the book, st- this all happened right after the George Floyd speech yep. um, that I made when it was just the day after he was killed. I was in Minneapolis and, um, you know, usually I prepare speeches and get it right and go through all the politically correct thing and t- things because, you know, I be having F words and everything and then I got to go back and take that stuff mm-hmm. out. And make sure that I don't get in trouble. Um, but I didn't care. I just said the truth. Like, you know, because they, they, what happened was they had started to change the narrative to looting and rioting and violence because stuff was burning in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. And when I stood up there and I, I started talking, I'm like, don't come to us about looting. Like, we don't give a damn. They could burn the whole city down. Right now, we're talking about a man's knee, a, ne- a man's knee and a, a black man's neck. That's and right. the thing is, we were just coming from um, Louis, I mean, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So we had just been with Breonna Taylor's family first time. We just met them. She's been dead two and a half months. No one is doing anything to help her family. The local community, they're trying to get her name out there, but it's not happening. Then Ahmaud Arbery happened right before that. Mm-hmm. And so now we're at George Floyd. And I didn't watch the video at that time, but I heard him calling for his mother. And it's almost like when you hear somebody calling for their mother, they're calling all the mothers. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it's like we, we just decided I decided to just tell the truth that day at the press conference to talk about the state of emergency that we're in and that we're just tired, like beyond tired. And obviously, people, it resonated because at the time I had 240,000 followers on Instagram and those was my debate buddies. Like Mm -hmm. it was my little community. By the time I finished speaking, there was a million people on my page. So I knew then that whatever I said, it resonated in a way that other people felt the same rage. Can I talk about speaking truth to power? Because. People be so afraid to speak truth to power, right? Like politicians can get asked a simple question like, is America a racist country? And they punt on the answer, right? You spoke truth to power in that speech. And it was a line in that speech where you said you don't care if they burn the targets down. Because Target. Target should be out here on the front lines with us. Do you know Target was the largest purchaser of your book? I've, like they, oh, <laughs> I have learned that. Look at the irony of that. I have learned that. But not only that, which is um, I appreciate Target for purchasing all the books that they, you know, supporting us in the way that they have. But even the day after, maybe the day or or two days after, Target put out a statement being like, we're not going to try to charge anyone. Like, there will be no criminal charges if people need to come into Target and get whatever you want. Take Mm -hmm. the milk, take all the things. Because the milk, that was one of my problems with another radio host that we will remain nameless from New York. Um, When he saw the milk being poured in Yandy's eyes, when you know the protests happened, remember when we were outside yeah, yeah, yeah. of MDC, the jail in Brooklyn, where they didn't have lights and hot water and mm-hmm. heat and all of that. We were living out there basically, and a situation happened where the police and families and activists got into it, and they maced everybody. And Yandy was one of the people maced, and so there's a there's footage of her 
and Jamila screaming because they had never been through anything like that before. And when folks bought the milk and poured it in her eyes, another radio host made like, like, oh, so they just had milk? Yes, because when yeah. you protest, you have milk for mace, but also we have been living outside the jail, so we had milk for cereal. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like people have no idea what goes into, what goes into it. Yeah. But again, so to obviously Target knew that milk and things like that would be important, and they allowed people to come in and get whatever they wanted. They just basically opened the doors, and folks was in there taking whatever they wanted. Wow. And that was after... After I said, you know, we don't care if they burn Target down. I guess Target was like, hey, to hell with it, because that's stuff. And they took your advice. They, I mean, that was their way, I guess, of being on the front lines. Yeah, it's like, yeah. that's stuff, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about human lives. That's right. And so there's no comparison. We don't care about buildings. Not that we want people to go out and burn up. Obviously, that is, that's not my politics. That's not what we do. And we try to encourage folks to understand that what happens when you start with the rioting and the looting, and, and I won't even say rioting. Let's not use their language. Mm-hmm. When the looting begins, we have to understand that it changes the narrative. They start to shift away from the dialogue that is so important about the actual issue. And now we're talking about a store that got broken into and who took what. But the other thing is, it's been coming out. And if you you just do the research, it's been a lot of white folks that were actually the yeah. ones breaking these doors and throwing, you know, f- burning buildings. Uh, Rayshard Brooks, mm-hmm. which is a sad situation where now the officer has been reinstated. restored, right, reinstated at, at his, in Atlanta. But the Wendy's, the people who burned the Wendy's down, it was white women. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, you know, sometimes it's detractors. And sometimes white folks are more upset than black people, and they shouldn't be. Like, relax. You get to the back. <laughs> That's right. Especially if y'all going to burn it down and we're going to get the blame for it. Right. But, and, and, and our people, when they see it happening, because of the rage and frustration, and there's some folks that just thinking they're going to get their little reparations, they do. I'm not saying that they don't participate. But the narrative becomes that this is black people being animals. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we want to happen when we have a very clear case of police brutality that we can use and we don't have to burn one building down to make change. You Absolutely. Know? Well, Tamika, there's so many things I know we have to talk about with you this morning, but I do want to start with your activism, right? Because you always have been very private about your personal life. And we all know you have a son who you dedicated this book to. So can you talk about how activism actually started for you? Because for a lot of people, it takes for something personal to happen in their life for them to get out there on those front lines. Yeah, you know, it was it was my parents for sure. My parents are activists. They've been in the movement for all, all my life. Um, And they are background folks. They're not the people out speaking. You will never know that they are there, if you will. But they put their money and their time into helping folks like Reverend Sharpton and just leaders in general for many, many years. And so I grew up in the movement. But it wasn't until Tariq, my son's father, was murdered. That's when I was like, oh, okay, wait a minute. There's there's a bigger problem happening here. Because I remember sitting back thinking to myself, how like why is he dead you know like how did this happen to us you know you always feel like why did this happen to my family you Mm -hmm. know it's happening but it's when it hits you that you realize there's a real problem and i sat back and thought about what he had been through in his life you know his parents were perpetual drug abusers that were in and out of prison and 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 the sad part about it is that they never got the treatment and care that we hear now for white kids with opioid abuse, right. right? They never got therapy and mental health support, which is what they needed because they um, want his mother is deceased, but his father is still alive. These are dynamic people, beautiful people. They just had the disease of addiction that they couldn't shake, you know. And so what if someone had helped them? And I talk about that, you know, in the book. Um, and it was when, and, 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 and I understood what he had been through. His grandparents, they were great people who stepped in and did all that they could. But there is something about your actual parents not having their lives together that can really mess up a kid. And he was caught up in the middle of that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he, he got himself in stuff he shouldn't have been involved in. He was killed by people who were supposed to be his friends. He was shot twice. He left in a ditch for two weeks before he was found. And when, you know, at, at the point that I was able to get past the grieving process, I started to understand that, wow, like, this is my work. You know, this is what I have to do. And that's how Erica Ford and I got really close from life camp with the gun violence work and A.T. Mitchell in Brooklyn. 
um, because I, I was like, okay, how do I get in this fight? And Erica said, listen, you like to hang out with the the politicians and all of that. We out here on the street. So what we need you to do is go get the bag from the politicians and bring it back to us. And that's how we started, which I also talk about the crisis management system, where we started with five million people being distributed to um, people like formerly incarcerated folks, people who have, you know, felony convictions and all of that to help with gun violence. And we were able to collect data that shows that when those people are out there doing the work, it brings down the need for as many police. Right. So it, it reduces the amount of police that need to be in contact with communities. And it also impacts the number of violent um, incidents happening in those communities. So a situation like Micaiah Bryant, mm -hmm. the 16 the year old who was killed just recently in Columbus, Ohio, and a situation like that, I heard Erica saying, yo, I take bleach, knives, guns, all types of stuff out of kids' hands That's every right. day. That's what I do for a living. And, it, and it, there was a way, there was a different way to go about that. But you have to be able to empower those organizations. So we started with $5 million, but now the budget is like four. 40, 50 million in New York that is invested in these different sites across the country. I mean, across this, this city, uh, Shanduk McFadden, mm -hmm. uh, GMAC. It's a you know a lot of them that work across the city. So, do you, do you think because uh, you dedicated state of emergency to your son Tariq, does he understand the magnitude of his mom's work? Child, <laughs> child, listen, <laughs> Tariq Ryan, he does understand, and he talks about it often. He knows um, what I've been doing, but I left my son a lot, a lot. Like he has definitely suffered as a result of me helping other people deal with their children, you know. Mm. And and that's and, and that's and, and that's one of the things that I also I talk about in the book. It's like if you want to deal with if you're a new person that's popping up like, yo, I want to get in this movement. I, I, I feel it. You know, I'm here. The first thing you got to do is deal with your own stuff, right? Your own family, your mama's racist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You got your own things to deal with. But I understand from raising my son how hard it is to turn inter internal and deal with that. Because when I'm talking to him, I'm like, what kind of, who, what? Like, what kind of conversations are we having here? You supposed to just get it. And he's yeah. like, nah, because I know, I know the real you. I know a lot about you and you are not as perfect. As you think you are. And that's a reflection of he and I and the dynamics of our relationship where sometimes it's like, boom, but don't but let me go out and help somebody else. Child, I'm all over it. I got yeah, it together. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. the right things to say. You know, I'm out here changing lives. So that's a tough, tough situation. And that's why I dedicated the book to him, because I wanted him to know this is what I've been doing. Um, I'm sorry that I have not been there for you the way that you need it. But I love you. Mm -hmm. I love you so much that I'm doing this work. Absolutely. You 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 talk about uh you know in the first section the legacy of activism and I'm glad you wrote that because it's been all of these questions lately. Tamika like Tamika Mallory just came out of nowhere. Right. Like you know Tamika Mallory just got here. Right. That thing is because you look so young too. That's that's right. partially your fault right. for drinking so much water. So, but um, do you think you would be who you are as an activist what if you say it depends on? Well, do say. <laughs> It's <laughs> a combination. You, you think you would be who you are as an activist if your parents didn't get you into the work so young? No, mm -hmm. no, because they they were. So you know how you go to church on Sunday and that's like non-negotiable yes. in families. Like you could actually the parents could catch a case because they're going to beat you if they if you don't get up on a Sunday. That's how Saturdays were for us for rallies. There was no conversation about it. You knew you had to go or you couldn't live in their home. And that's from 10 years old. Like you can't. There's no falling out. None of that. They wasn't with it. And so if I didn't, if they didn't put that type of pressure on me, I would never have been in this situation. Because by the way, by the time I got to be 12 or 13, I was a runaway. And so I, God knows where things would have ended up. My son is 22. Mm -hmm. I had him when I was 18. So you're talking about a very young girl who got involved with this guy and had a baby when my parents were trying to sh shift me into a total different direction. If they had not, um, you know, helped to establish the foundation that I had from very young, there probably wouldn't have been anywhere for me to return to, mm -hmm. you know, once I got myself together. But I was able to go back to the movement because that's what I knew. And now I'm coming back with a personal situation, a personal crisis that my son's father has been murdered and I get it. Mm. You know, I'm ready to work. So that's when I kind of took it on as my own. And then I was the one like, y'all not going to the rally? 
Like, what y'all doing? Why y'all resting? Yeah, like, yeah, let's yeah. go. Get it together. We got to be there at 2 o'clock. You know, I was I was much more adamant that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be and, and what I believe all of us should be doing. You know, Tamika, you have been doing this work for over 20 years. And I do think the timing for this book is perfect because you've also been getting criticism lately. Mm -hmm. And I know here on The Breakfast Club, we obviously know you personally and we know right. where your heart is. But then we've seen people being critical of you doing endorsements or we've seen people saying, OK, Black Lives Matter and Tamika Mallory, you know, at the Grammys performing right. and right. She's doing this because she wants to get attention for herself and to doing this to make money. So how do you respond and how does that make you feel? knowing that that's not where your heart is? Well, it depends on where it's coming from. Some people I could care less. Other people, especially when you when you have someone, a mom, you know, who obviously doesn't know me um, and has a real uh, lack of understanding about who I am and how long I've been doing this and my commitment, that hurt, you know, it definitely hurt. Um, but like I said, there's other people, they never going to like me and I don't like them either. So it's cool. We just ain't going to, it ain't going to work out. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. Right. I keep it moving. When people say you, you are trying to get yourself known. I don't know what they think. Like I, the reason why I get the opportunities that I have is because I'm known, you know, because mm -hmm. I have already been doing this work for so long that people know when the crisis um, of the of of 2020 was happening, um, you know, all the police brutality, all the stuff we already talked about. Folks were calling me not they weren't calling me like, oh, I saw you on TV. Let me give you a check or can you come and speak to uh, my group or whatever? They were calling me like, yo, I've been talking to you. Help us because we, we, we should have been paying attention to what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. But we weren't. And now I need you to come to my company, my school, my this, my that. Or, you know, let me write a check to help you with your efforts. Um, and so, you know, I, I can't I can't allow it. I know the truth. And most of the people that I work with every day, they know as well. It's all distraction tactics. Like it, 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 there is an actual attempt to distract and destroy the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm not talking about the organization. I know them very well. Love Sister Patrice. Love them all. But I am not a part of Black Lives Matter, the organization. My organization is called Until Freedom. However, we get grouped in together and people don't care what organization you're with. They're trying to destroy the entire movement. And unfortunately, they use people who look like us to be able to do it. This is not new. This whole COINTELPRO the tactics that have now changed or not changed, but transformed to or evolved into trolling online. Right. Mm -hmm, Cause there mm -hmm. was no online before, before it was people showing up at the protests, becoming a part of your organization. They still do that. Of course, um, like the black Panthers and they, and they come and infiltrate from the inside and destroy what is being built. But, and now what they're doing is trolling online so that they can discredit you and have people, when they hit your profile, they hit your page, the comments are crazy. Oh, you know, she's a fraud. She's this, she's that. Mm -hmm. I just leave the shit on there and be like, y'all just keep talking. Like, I don't delete comments. I don't do any of that because I know that the work that we're doing is shining through. And by the way, most of the critics are people who are not outside. Like, I never see them on any street corner. I don't see them helping families. I don't see them doing anything. That's right. I often wondered, where were those people a few years ago when, when they were trying to script everything away from you? Oh, well, that's a whole different conversation. You know what I mean? Like, that's a whole different... Most people, um, they don't even know the story. They yeah, don't even yeah, know. Yeah. Like, they find... They're like, oh, I didn't know that that happened. I didn't know that, you know, you had been uh, labeled an anti-Semite. They don't know anything about what mm -hmm. I went through. Uh, they just... And, and by the way, once we start having those conversations, most of those people are like, oh, damn, I, I didn't know all of that, you know, and then it, it kind of changes like the, the Cadillac commercial. They were like, oh, you know, you worked with Cadillac. No, I didn't work with Cadillac. I actually work with Spike, Spike Lee's. Lee. Yeah, with um, Spike Lee's um, ad, his ad agency Can or we brand talk about that? agency. Talk about that. Talk, Cadillac, Cadillac didn't approach you. Spike Lee approached you. Yeah, his well, not Spike Lee, mm -hmm. but his company approached me to do a, a spot with them for Women's History Month. Um, and so they had a budget to 
put black folks together to talk about black issues and particularly black women. And they add, they didn't come and get me because they I'm trying to make myself known. Again, they came to get me because they were like, no, we need your message as a part of this because that's the whole point of this piece is mm-hmm. to show different elements of, you know, black women, activists, artists, entertainers. We're going to put all of that together. And they said, and we want you to be the central component, if you will, of the spot. I said, sure, you know, and and it was a beautiful spot. It was Mm -hmm. done well. Um, You know, there were some people who were like, oh, well, what about black men? I didn't know that we couldn't celebrate Women's History Month. It was Women's History Month. (laughs) I didn't know we couldn't do that, you know. Then they said, well, she has an endorsement with Cadillac. Well, I don't. But even if I did have an endorsement with Cadillac, a part of the deal is that they are distributing funds, resources, to organizations that do um, criminal justice work and, you know, work with mass incarceration issues and, you know, and, and, and other black causes, if you will. That's a part of the whole package deal of what's happening with their with their company. Does, do they have other issues? General Motors? Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. And it's always going to be issues when you're working with white folks that own these big companies. Mm-hmm. Like it's going to you're going to have to fight for the marketing dollars because you see, you know, Roland Martin and others are trying to get black media. Well, to get um, uh, to get the um, the media budgets to be specifically designated in a substantial way to black media. That's right. Real owned black media, not black faces on other networks, but actual black media. I support that. I'm not going to say because I did a spot for them that now I won't, I'll be silent when it comes to, no, we can fight for that and do the spots. We need to be in every single place within the organization. Who's in your senior leadership? We want people to have jobs. We want folks on the board. I mean, across the board, we can we can fight for all those things, walking true bubblegum at the same time. Yeah, I never understood the backlash from Cadillac because we asked these corporations to make these kind of investments right. in our community. So they went to a black production company, Spike Lee's company, who right. came to a a woman who is a leader in our community to be in a commercial talking about black issues. Right. For a car that we buy. For a car that we buy. We buy, I got one, we I, buy Cadillac. I, I've owned two in my life. <laughs> right. one Me now. too. So what's the problem? I, I did not understand that backlash. Right. Well, you know, again, you got to look at the sources of the people with the issue. Mm-hmm. Because there were folks that once I made a statement about it, they were like, oh, I'm sorry that I even went down that road of just of doubting. You know, People doubt black women, especially all the time. Mm -hmm. We're always being challenged. People don't believe that we're sincere. They always looking for like, you know, where's the hidden trick? That's just the way it is. And I do believe people say, well, Tamika, you don't have to prove anything to anyone. I understand the sentiment of that. But I do believe that we have to continue to prove to our people that we're going to be consistently 10 toes down. You know, and that we're not going to change just because we're closer in proximity to success or to what people think is being successful. But I also have folks questioning why Cardi B, um, you know, and Angela Davis in the forward of your book. I definitely won't get to that. If you don't understand that, then I don't know what to tell you. Explain. Why why do you have Cardi B as the forward? Well, first of all, you should buy the book so you can read it and understand the context. But Cardi is basically... Ask, saying to Angela Davis, I'm unbuttoned as hell. Like, I don't speak all the right words. I don't know all the laws. I don't have it all together. I, You know, I'm just a regular girl who actually became successful based upon my art, right? So I'm not a typical activist. But I care about black people getting shot down on the streets. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Dr. Davis, you are queen of all queens in terms of this movement Is there space for me next to you at the table? And Dr. Davis... Don't give them all. I don't give it all No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to say. And Dr. Davis Mm -hmm. responds to her. Mm -hmm. She tells a story about Nina Simone, who we know was an an entertainer, um, but also a part of the movement. And so it's a powerful exchange. And I personally am a mixture between Cardi B and Dr. Davis. That's my truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe you can twerk and work. That's what that's 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 my that's my truth. So that's why I chose them. Mm -hmm. And I find it disturbing that people have issues with like a Yandy and Portia coming out and being at some of these protests and supporting it. And then they act like it's not genuine. Well, they say 
y'all need to be doing this. They don't, they don't, they're not involved in the community. They don't do anything for us. And then when people when people do it, they get the backlash. And so that's why you have a lot of folks out here who want to be more involved, but they're afraid to do it because they think it's not going to be looked at as genuine. Here's the deal, though. This is what I need to say so people understand. When you look at me and say, well, why are you why are you on Love & Hip Hop? You know, we've done several episodes with Love & Hip Hop. Cardi in my book. I think people are confused about who I'm trying to reach. And, and I think that's, that must be a, that's a failure on my part. I will accept that, that maybe I have not been clear enough. I am not looking for bougie black folks as my audience. Those are my people. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a link, right? Mm-hmm. Where many of the other links, it's a women's organization, uh, a organization full of very, very successful black women. And, and they kind of bougie. And that's my people. I mm-hmm. like to hang out with them. Those are my people. But that's not who I'm looking for. I'm out here trying to reach Ray Ray and Keisha (laughs) on street corners across America, right? Ray Ray and Keisha watch Love and Hip Hop. They listen to Cardi. That's where I have to go in order to get the people because the, 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 the central component of my work at Until Freedom, the organization that Linda Sarsour, attorney Angelo Pinto, and our boy, my son, Lennon, my brother, um, that the organization that we co-founded, the central component of it is that the most marginalized people, the people who are impacted the most, have to be at the center of the solution, that they are the that's the voice that we have mm-hmm. to uplift. So if that's the case, I really can't get it by just sitting in a church. Not saying that they're not there as well, but that's not my audience. That's not who I'm You're looking to reach. people where they are. That's exactly right. So, yeah, I'm going to do some love and hip hop stuff. I'm going to be and my show is called my hour podcast on the Black Effect Network. Hey. Uh, it's called Street Politicians. My book is going to cover and talk about people like Cardi. That's that's the audience that I'm going for. You know, even with the Grammy performance, right? And you got backlash for that. What bothered me about that was nobody talked about what you spoke about. Right. Well, well you challenged Joe Biden. Right. The conversation people are having now right, saying exactly. these elected officials are being so quiet about voter suppression right. and so quiet about them stripping away our civil rights. Right. You challenged right. the president right. of the United States of America. But yet you had to deal with the backlash from your own people just because you were on the stage at the Grammys. Right. Well, and that's so I, I reposted and shared after they everybody was Joe Biden hasn't done anything for black people, which Dr. Umar, when he was here, that kind of sparked the conversation mm-hmm. again. And he said some real live stuff like it was he was he, he you know, he was on point in a lot of ways. And a lot of folks were like, oh, that's right. You know, Biden hasn't done this or that. Well, I would challenge that there has been some things done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's first of all. And one of them is that five billion dollars is now being um, allotted for violence. And at the center of the conversation is black folks because they had Erica Erica Ford Ford, and others at the White House sitting in the in the Rose Garden. And they have opened up uh, several city agencies. And I think that's like another 10 billion dollars that people can access in, you know, mental health, like in healthcare and other areas. And so we as black people have to know how to how to access that. And and there are a number of folks that are working on grants and other things so that mm-hmm. we can help organizations get that money. I do understand that they're like, well, it's not just for black people. So I get it. I get the, the nuance of the conversation. But let's not uh, ignore some things that have absolutely happened now. When uh, I look, I lost my train of thought because that was good. Whatever I was no, you were talking about. Um, <laughs> you, you were talking about the backlash from the Grammy performance, right? Yeah. Oh shoot, I still don't know what I was gonna say. Anyway, keep them going. No, you were talking about the backlash from the Grammy performance, and I was saying that I didn't understand the backlash because you were up there challenging Joe Biden. Oh right, so I reshared mm-hmm. the statement that I made, which I specifically said, Joe Biden, this is what we demand, right? Now, it was however many bars y'all tell me, you know, my son be like, it's 16 bars or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it was a short period. Mm-hmm. But in every opportunity that we get, it doesn't matter if you get to say one word, five words or 100, we should be using it as an opportunity to challenge the institution, if That's you right. will. Now, the night of the Grammy speech and, the, and that next morning, it was the media, all my alerts, the Google alerts were like, Tamika Mallory challenges Joe Biden. And in fact, people were calling. I think you called me and said you got you got a call from somebody like, why does yeah, she have Democratic to say? Party. Yeah, yeah like, upset. why does yeah. she have to say that? You know, we're trying to do the work, blah, blah, blah. So we were on the right track. And then the mess started. 
And that shifted the conversation because this is what I know. What I know about our oppressors is that they sit back, they'll they'll do their own work, their own dirty work. But if they learn that we're willing to do it for for them, they sit back, they step back, they say, oh, okay, we don't even got to worry about That's it. That's right. Because they fussing over something else. And then they put their bots and their trolls in the mix. And so they take the messaging, whatever you saying, oh, uh, this person says, why is Tamika Mallory on the Grammys? And the next thing you know, you got all these fake accounts online saying the same thing because they are helping to be divisive. That's it's a strategy. It's a real but we have to easy be, to figure out. We got to be smart enough to understand that those are coordinated attacks, right? Because right. it, it it went from you, then it went to Patrice. That's right. It was coming at Sean. Like that. that that's not coincidence. It's not. <laughs> like it's not. It's not. And they basically tried to make people believe that Patrice took money from the Black Lives Matter ninety million dollars that they raised in the last year and used it to buy homes. But if you read the story, you see that she's been buying homes since 2016. Mm -hmm. And and, and actually, that's what everybody's been telling us to do. Every every financial advisor that we talk to, especially as activists, that they know money changes. Today, you could, you know, have support. And then tomorrow, the support can wean. You don't always have that. So they tell you. Take your money. This one right here, Angela has been working. <laughs> She's been on my behind about like where are we going to invest? It does. She's like, yo, you can buy a house for ten thousand dollars. It's not. It doesn't have to be that expensive. Buy it. Do what you need to do to renovate it and then resell it or hold it. You know, so this is what she's been trying to teach me. So Patrice actually is doing something to secure the future for her child. But the way they tell the story, they know how to shape that narrative to get you upset, believing that she's still. And and then we find out she's never even taken a salary from Black Lives Matter. Right. Mm -hmm. She's a writer, an author who has a a, a really significant book. book, Right. She is TV production company. Right. TV production. Um, She's a speaker. She is a a professor. You know, this girl's got a lot of other things going on. And yet they really did their best to make it seem like she stole money from the organization for her property. And if you don't do your research and you just read a headline, you will really believe believe that. And then share it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing I want to say about that, Tamika, as far as like us having conversations, I would hate for you to do this work that you do, right, where you're putting your life on the line, literally, where you can't even let people know where you're going or where you're staying because anything could happen to you. You know, it's a constant risk and you not to have some place to lay your head at night when you are at home, when you are able to be home. Right. That's comfortable that all this work that you're doing, that you don't have something to pass down to your son. Right. Obviously, you're a speaker also. Now you're an author. You know, congratulations on that. But you should have money. There's no reason <laughs> that you should be broke just because you do this activism work. Oh, and I'm not going to be. That's right. 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 There's right. two things that I'm not going to be broke and I'm, and I'm always going to be cute. That I'm going to do those things. Because my grandmother used to say, no matter what's going on, your husband left you, your dog died, you lost your job, get up, clean yourself up, put some lipstick on, and step out into the world like you know it's all coming back to you, right? So that's just, that's the way I was raised. And even when it was H&M, I was going, well, let me not give H&M uh, too much play on this show, <laughs> right? But even when it was H&B, you know, I, I've put it together well because that's just something that I'm always going to do. I don't know why people worrying so much about other folks' stuff. I'm just confused. I do get, though, that there has to be accountability for yes, from organizers. There has to be accountability for Black Lives Matter. What are y'all going to do with $90 million? That's a lot of money, and that's it's right. a lot of people on these streets that's hurting. And there are a lot of chapters and others who need it. Shoot, Until Freedom is going to apply for some of the resources, because you there's an actual portal where, as an organization, you can go and apply. And, mm-hmm. and we're going to apply, because we need the resources. And we also understand that when the $90 million is coming in, it's coming in, because, again, we get grouped together. That's, some people are seeing us on the streets of... Louisville, Kentucky, they might not know that the the folks there, you know, Until Freedom is one of the organizations along with others, um, you know, and they might see us as Black Lives Matter and they may have given donations thinking that they were supporting our work. So we're going to apply and hope that we can get some of the resources Mm because we need it. It takes money. Absolutely. Tamika, to back it up for a second, right, I am going to ask you something that you never talk about. Mm -hmm. So, is Tamika Mallory dating anybody? Because I went (laughs) awesome. 
that you are not at least having somebody that's there to give you them hugs oh, and cuddle Lord. with. People don't going be wanting to date me, child. They don't, you know, people be like, <laughs> your DMs must be popping. They're not. They're just not. I, I feel so sorry for you and Angela Rye, all of y'all. Like y'all, 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 y'all just why well, is it so look, bad? Amanda for y'all? got a man now. Seals got a man. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. thank God for that. I yeah. wrote on her page. I said this makes me feel <laughs> like there is hope. That's There's an old bay too. Hope. That's an old college bay. Yeah. What? Well, um, yeah. Oh, so I got to go yeah. back in yeah. the archive. You got to go back in the crate. <laughs> yeah. But what? What do you look for in a man? Because I'm sure it is intimidating for somebody to feel like, okay, I got to approach Tamika Mallory like. What kind of person, what kind of man would you want to date? I definitely do not need someone that does the exact same work that I do, right? Because we can't both be crazy. It needs to be somebody around that also can deal with our financial stability, right? And I don't mean they have to have all the money. I'm just saying that they even need to know how to invest my savings, right? Mm -hmm. So I need Mm -hmm. somebody that has that kind of mindset, but they have to care about the work. They have to be a supporter of the movement and understand what I have to do. And by the way, I don't have time. Like, I, I, don't, I don't even call people back. That's part of why I'm not dating. Because I've had folks hit me up like, <laughs> yo. And then it's six days later and I'm like, oh, shoot. Like, I, yo, I swear it's not you. It's mm-hmm. me. You know, so that it, it does make it a little difficult. And they have to be able to understand that. So you want to balance the ratchetness and righteousness? Those- like, how does a man approach you? Do you yeah, say, I feel I'm a lake, what's right. up, my nigga? Which yeah, one is it? I mean, yeah, a little bit of both. Okay. A little bit of both. I did a little bit of both. You probably get those long both. text messages that start off with, you know, you really make time for things that you care about. Yeah, I can't and- do that. <laughs> See, I can't do it. If they start, I can't. And once you start talking about, oh, you know, I can't believe you, I'm like, oh, this is a dub. It's not going to work <laughs> out because that's going to happen over and over again. And we and, and, I, and I actually had somebody that I was dating who said that to me? Like, you know, it's just it. It's not enough, you know. And I'm like, I get it. I totally get it. I would think that you would want somebody that would help you take your mind off the work, though. Yeah, I do. I need yeah. somebody that, if I'm on it, they could be like, "Yo, I read three articles, and either I don't agree with your position on it, so they could give me a different perspective, or these are some of the things you're missing, right?" So I need mm-hmm. somebody that's smart. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't need a person that every day they're on it just the same way that I am because it's not going to work out. And by the way, they may we might be in compromised situations where we on different sides of an issue and that could create a whole problem in your household. So I don't need that much of I don't need him to be that deep into it. What about a white man? Hell no. Never. (laughs) (laughs) Never. You know why? And I'm not this is it's not. And I'm not saying because I don't know about people's sexual relationships, but I can't do it. I personally would not be able to lay down with a white man every night. Just ain't going to work. I'm, I get it. I totally understand. That would look crazy. Well, Tamika listen, Mallory, pro-black. But, I, but that's today. <laughs> if I'm still single in 10 years, nope. we might be having a different nope. conversation because I might be desperate for a husband. No, nope. nah, I never will. <laughs> My son would not. My son would have a stroke. Your son, my son, <laughs> everybody, Charlemagne, no, everybody, everybody, Dr. Umar. Not gonna happen. <laughs> right, right. Not gonna happen. But you know, I want to go back to your activism for a second. Why do people? If you just read a book, right, you realize Martin Luther King Jr. got paid for speaking engagements. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. got paid for book deals. So did Malcolm X. Right. Martin Luther King Jr. loved to look nice. Yeah, so right. did Malcolm oh, X. Sure did. Why do they act like this is like a new thing? Well, not only that. Harry Belafonte used his money that he was getting from his entertainment work. That's right. And helped to really pretty much support Dr. King. That's right. Making sure he has somewhere to live. How do you think that Dr. King was flying? What do people think it happens when you are when you live in New York and then a mother calls you from, you know, wherever and says, I need you to meet me in Virginia or whatever? How do you get there? It's That's free? Right. Walk? Even if you walked. You might need certain kind of shoes to get there. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm being funny, but you need to eat. That's right. Where you going to sleep at? The mother don't have the money. Most of the time, we spend our money supporting families. Now, and and, and I don't have the kind of money to, like, give them, you know, $100,000. But 
Sabrina Fulton, the Trayvon Martin Foundation, they have a, a major event coming up this weekend. My organization, they, we donated. We invested in it, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and it might not be $50,000, but it's something. It's what we have. And I've done that with all the families that I work with. Breonna Taylor's mother, Tamika Palmer, will be the first one, honey. She'd be ready to fight physically in the street for me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because she understands that she literally was holding her dead daughter. That's it. That's This is what she had for two and a half months. Me and my daughter. My daughter's dead. There's some folks that are, you know, in the na- in the community that are speaking out. Mm-hmm. But this is not a worldwide issue. They, they shot my daughter to death in her house. What are we going to do? And then Ben Crump. To his credit, an attorney, Lanita Baker, they got in touch with us and they said, can you help to bring some attention to this situation? We went to Louisville, Kentucky, and then Breonna Taylor asked, as we got Alicia Keys involved, Rhapsody. We did a whole campaign, which you were a part of, Yee, um, which, you know, talking about, do you know what happened to Breonna Taylor? Ellen mm-hmm. DeGeneres. I mean, it was huge. Mm-hmm, Jada mm-hmm. Pinkett. Everybody got involved with it. Not only Cardi. did not only Cardi. Cardi was one of the she was the one that told us what to do for the campaign, like what to say. Uh, she kind of helped produce it. The not only did it help to bring international attention to Breonna Taylor. The other thing that it did was help the young lady, Katora Haran, who works um, at the ACLU in Lou in Kentucky. She was able to get the um, Breonna's law passed locally in Louisville, which is a ban on no-knock warrants. That was a part of the steam. You know, she was already doing the work, so we're not taking anything from it. But the steam was that Alicia and all of them put out this campaign a few days before the vote and, and told people to start calling, basically, you know, advocating for the bill to be passed. And it was. So all of these things kind of work together. And of course, that's the other criticism. Oh, we don't see y'all getting any laws passed. That's a lie. We actually have been a part of, and it's not just this, and we don't have enough time to talk about all the stuff that I've been involved in for 25 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I support you just because you are who you say you are. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to tell all, all the business, but it, I've had conversations with you. I remember one in particular a few years ago when you called me and you were like down to your last dollar, if, oh, absolutely. if, if anything, right? Yeah. That and was I, and, in 2019. Yes, and I remember you saying verbatim, I cannot take any money from any of these corporate people because if I do, as soon as I do that, I'm just like all these yep. other activists who yep. are doing it for the wrong reason. Yep. That right there told me everything I need to know about yep. you. Yep. In, that, in that moment, you said, I need somebody black financing my Helping us. organization. Yep. And, then Jay, I can, and I, you went and helped get Jay. Well, I didn't want Jay-Z. to say all that. But nah, yeah. Okay. Shoot. Cool. But the I, I want the story. The, yes, truth. the truth is the truth. The truth is the truth. You went and called Jay-Z and said, Tamika and my son are out here doing this work and they, they need resources. You got to help them. And then he called us and had us to come in, and we and and they have supported our work. Salute to Rock Nation. And it's, Des, I have to yep. say, Des, right? They they came through and they said we got y'all. I remember Jay called me on the phone one day, like, "All right, so you really ready to do this? Because I'm not trying to put resources behind somebody that's not serious about what you're doing." He's like, "I know I'm getting the message through this one, Charlemagne, and I'm not. T- I want to talk to you to know who you are." He already knew mice, so he already understood that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we had a great conversation. And he was very supportive. And we don't we have tried not to lean on them um, but so much because we go out and we work on we have our merch up, you know, our Until Freedom merch. People could go to untilfreedom.com and buy sweatsuits, which are actually like good mm-hmm. sweatsuits and great colors, and a lot of people wear them fashionably. I know I do. Um, so we have other avenues and ways that folks can support us. And you're right, Charlemagne. I was that year. Not only was I broke financially, I was broke broke spiritually. Like I had to go to a drug treatment program that year because of all the stress from the women's march. I got addicted to Xanax and other painkillers. Like I went through a lot that people have no idea about. And I was going through all of that because I just I decided and 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 refused. To speak against Minister Farrakhan, That's right. I, I said I don't agree with the minister on certain things that he says, and particularly some of the things that he was saying about the Jewish community. I was like, that's not my words, right? And and we don't agree, and that's it. I was totally fine with that. I'm not I'm not in a in a position where I have no choice but to stand with somebody. I'm afraid to speak out and say I don't agree. I was able to do that, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to use your language of you telling me that I have to denounce 
a black man, I think America does a great job of denouncing black men every day. And mm -hmm. as a black woman who has a black son, that's not something that I was willing to participate in. And guess what? They stripped, as you said, they stripped me as much as they could of everything, everything. All my speaking engagements were canceled. Relationships that I had with people, there were folks leaving our organization. It was so painful. And I ended up getting in a situation where, you know, like I said, I was addicted. That's the that's the fact. And then one day I woke up and was like, okay, life is, I'm getting things back together. I don't need to take these pills anymore. And my bones was hurting. That's right. And I was like, oh, shoot, what, am I, what do I do? I called Jason Williams, the former, um, uh, well, he's an NBA all-star forever, right? They mm -hmm. ne that's never former, right? Okay, so a NBA all-star who I knew he had started doing drug treatment programs um, in Florida. And I called him and asked him would he help me. And he placed me in a program and they got me straight. So wow. that's just the fact. It's just the truth. Well, my, my point with that story is if there was a time for you to sell out, if that there was, was a time the for you to compromise yourself, it would have been then. Was I the was, I'm, I'm on the phone with you, and you're like, I can, I'm not doing that. You refuse to compromise yep. yourself. And so, so it's now, just like when I see people attacking you, I'm like, y'all don't even know her, right? Like and she, so now, because because you gotta, you know, nuance is important. Because there'll be people like, oh, well, why is she taking corporate money now? I'm, it's not that I'm taking corporate money. I have a partnerships with certain individ, certain people, which is not many, because most of the corporations that come to us. We can't work with them. Like Fashion Nova and Meg Thee Stallion did something. That's a good point. So Fashion Nova and Meg Thee Stallion gave Until Freedom money recently. And that's obviously a corporate entity. But the relationship it was Meg that called us. Right. Mm -hmm. That's like, yo, I want to give y'all some resources that came through Brianna's family. Um, that's usually what happens. It's not like white folks. Sylvia Roan called us like, yo, we want to support you. It's generally through black people in these companies mm -hmm. that they want to work with us and partner with us on things. So folks will say, well, how come you could do it now? Why is because our people have invested in us so much that we don't need the check from Fashion Nova, but it's good to have it. You understand what I'm mm -hmm, saying? Mm -hmm. It's not like we down to the last dollar, which means now I'm willing to compromise anything because I need to put food in my refrigerator. But instead, the situation we're in is balanced enough where if no if no company ever came to us, we still good because the people have been investing five dollars, ten dollars a month, mm -hmm. keeping us going. I get a check every single month for fifty dollars from a woman. That fifty dollars goes a long way. It helps pay the phone bills. It does a lot for us. So people that think I got to have a hundred thousand. That's not necessarily uh, the only way to support. It's one way, but it's not the only way to support that fifty dollars a month. That actually helps us to keep going. And also to your point, you got black people in these positions at these corporate that's places right. that's saying, no, put money over there. Over if y'all want to help, yeah. if y'all want to figure out something y'all can do for black people, put money into these different organizations. Right. That's right. Now, in the book, you speak on the performance of being black in America <laughs> and you speak on it as being exhausting. Sure. What, what, what does that mean? So, well, you know, I also uh, talk about a set of rules. I don't know if you were going to bring that up, but mm -hmm. I have yeah. this set of rules in the book where it's kind of sarcastic, but it's real. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, as a black woman, you don't go to your job and break down crying because they're going to say that you're unstable. They might think you crazy and call human resources to have you removed from the building. Mm -hmm. Yet white women right. can go have complete blow ups at work. And there is a total different response to like her mental health and what have you. That's a part of the performance. You can't even be yourself. You can't even get upset in out in public. You know, you, you, you got to deal with people touching your hair. Um, looking at you, you know, I have a cousin that's dealing with that right now on her job in the state of Delaware. Her her boss, take your shoes off. Let me see, you know, how, how you look when you don't have your shoes on. Um, what? You know, what color is that on your nails? Uh, what kind of hairstyle? This is something that black women and women and, and black people in general, especially when working in corporate spaces, have to deal with all the time. And you can't show but so much emotion because at the point that you do, you become a danger. Right. And so the performance is just constantly walking around knowing you're never able to just be you. You're always knowing that this skin tone is what's leading. And therefore, I have to be very careful about how I present. Mm. And that right. and that 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 is that's a part of the oppression that we deal with every day that makes us depressed. 
and makes us angry. You know, we're gonna be talking about that tonight on our on the the virtual book tour. That's right. That's right. You know what? And else? Like, look, oh, even right now, me and Tamika have these braids in our hair, right? Oh, I have a friend braids. who's an attorney, and she's like, "Oh, I can't. Um, when I have to do these zooms, I have to make sure my hair is straightened." And even like news reporters, a lot of times they used to always have to have their hair straightened in order to be on television. You're not even allowed to have braids in certain environments at yeah. all, just to even get on a Zoom and do a call. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the point, right? That's the mm-hmm. performance. That's the performance that we go through, and um. I don't know. I feel like more we are we are breaking barriers because more of us are rejecting those constructs, if you will. More of us are rejecting it. However, there are a lot of people who are too afraid to show up as their full selves. That's not our situation here. We like this is it. You got what you got. But there are a lot of people who are afraid because they need they need their checks. That's just the truth. They need their checks, their children in college. They can't go to work and and do but too much. However, the last year has allowed folks to be as black as they want to be in a lot of different spaces because folks are now like, wait a minute, what's up with this racism thing? Like, have we been a part of it? I've actually had white people ask me, do you think that I'm racist? Like, you know, really? Mm-hmm. And, and they mean it, mm-hmm. which has which is a part of the audible version um, that you did. The, we've got the, answers. Yeah, yeah, we've got answers. Um, you know, people wanting to understand. And it's exhausting to have to keep educating folks over and <laughs> over again. But I promise you, there are people who are really trying to learn and they want to help. They want to be different. They just really don't know. And that's what State of Emergency is about. It's a book for them. That's right. So explain, so explain Kamala, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris and explain you know, OG Jim Clyburn, people that I thoroughly enjoy, thoroughly like, but they still have to say things like America isn't a racist country. Why haven't politicians gotten the memo that we can speak truth to power? Well, the sad part with um, the VP, who I voted for Joe Biden because of Kamala Harris being on the ticket, Same. right? So I hold her more responsible than him. I have no expectations from a 70-plus-year-old white man at all. So whatever he is doing is more than what I thought he was going to do. Mm-hmm. My my eggs are in her basket, especially if she wants to become president in 2022. 24. Right? 24, mm-hmm. excuse me. 2024. That's right. Lord, I'm moving too quick. Um, but it's midterms in 2022. That's right. Um, and so it's sad because we know she knows because the way because of the way she phrased the, the answer. Mm-hmm. She tried to say, well, it's not a racist country, but we got to deal with the racism in the country. And I get the point that she's trying to make is like, I'm not going to sit here and say all the people in America are racist, but we're talking about institutions and constructs. And we know that the foundation of America is as racist as ever. Right. We know that. And, and it's sad that she's still not in a place to just say it. And I think she would have really won some points. That's right. With our community for just being for just straight up saying what we know, because right. we already know. Clyburn, I have some other representative Clyburn, you know, and, and, it's, and it's, 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 it's always difficult because I know these folks very well. It's 25 years of relationships. I love Representative Clyburn. Same. Like, cool dude, good dude, real good dude. But he's wrong. He was wrong on defund, defunding the police. Right. He tried to make this, you know, to create this narrative that, um, you know, we weren't going to be able to hold and or obtain seats in the election because of the people who support defund the police. Well, what, how did Cori Bush and Jamal uh, Bowman get in, in to be congressional members? Mm-hmm. How is AOC holding on to her seat? The lady was before she before she became uh, Congresswoman um, um, Alexandria Ocasio. The lady was was busting tables. Mm-hmm. OK, and she beat an incumbent. How is that happening? It's clear to me that there's an appetite for real radical change. And I think that Clyburn and his position on that was wrong. But now, just yesterday, here I go listening to Teslin Figaro. I need to stay on Teslin's page, (laughs) yo. Teslin, she puts me through a lot because, you know, Teslin be saying real stuff and you can't ignore it. Straight shot, no chaser. Straight shot, no chaser. Mm -hmm. I go to her page in the morning time yesterday and she's on there like, yo. What is Clyburn talking about? He's talking about we we don't need um, as a part of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to have the component that ends qualified immunity, mm-hmm. bruh. That's the only point that matters. Word up. 
And you have congressional um, uh, congressional members like Cory Bush saying we're not even trying to we don't even want to hear it. Like that's the part that has to be in. And I had somebody on my page. And that's why political education is very, very important. Somebody on my page was like, you need to deal with senators. You know, the bill's already passed in the House. You know, they the, the congressional members are already on their page. It's with the Senate now. And so let's go after people like Manchin, who is a senator in West Virginia who votes like a Republican mm-hmm. most of the mm-hmm. time. He caucuses pretty much with Republicans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do have to go after them. But in every single strategy, if you pay attention to history, the first thing they have to do is to be able to get black folks to go against other black people. That's what they need as the solid foundation so that they can come and say, well, there actually isn't an appetite for us to pass this bill with this particular component, that's right. right? That's So that's why they need somebody with as much power and influence as a Jim Clyburn to be the one to basically turn his back on us because qualified immunity is the heart of the bill. That's right. That's the heartbeat. Without that, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is pretty much trash, mm-hmm. right? We need that. And 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 to have Joe Biden, this is another thing I don't understand about black people, Lenar. I really don't. And South Carolina is your state, so perhaps you can help us. I'm trying to understand. If you have the president saying we need to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act by May 25th, the anniversary of when George Floyd was killed, why won't you go tell Chuck Schumer in the Senate to pass it whip, Mr. Whip, Clyburn. That's right. Go tell him to do it. Don't break down on us now. Don't abandon right. it I now. Agree. Use your spine. That's right. <sighs> don't, like, don't, don't pass it uncompromised. That's what they're trying to do, right? Like, yeah. they're trying to compromise it. Compromise like, don't let it be compromised. Compromise trying to say, take else. this out, then it'll pass. No. 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 It's pointless. I don't want no symbolic mm-hmm. passing of the George Floyd Policing Act on the, on George Floyd's birthday or the anniversary of his death, whatever it is. I don't want that. I want something that has some teeth in it. Right. We. Yeah, they can... I, I promise you that I can I, that I can surely speak today on on behalf of George Floyd's family. I believe they would be fine with me saying this. If not, I'll get in trouble, but I won't. If you pass it on June 1st, that would be fine with them, too. All right. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't try to make the date the thing that since we try to get this date, we need to compromise. Don't do that. Mm-mm. Don't sell them out like Mm-mm. that. They want to make sure that the bill has teeth as well. So don't put that on, well, this is the anniversary and we're trying to get the bill passed, so therefore, no. That, that's not what we're looking for. We need the bill to be passed the appropriate way. And there should be a real serious conversation about having our own people be the ones that are sometimes the biggest, uh, what's the word? Blockers of progress. Yeah, Obstacle. that. Obstacles. Obstacles. Obstacles of progress, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Now, it's Tamika, I know in your book, you also talk about how accountability, right? If you see something going down, you have to make sure that you are either there recording it, that you intervene, you let people know I'm watching, I'm seeing what's happening. And I saw you posted something about yourself getting harassed also, oh, right? And attacked. Yeah. And I saw you post that you were with Reverend Marissa Farrow in the bar at the hotel lobby. And you said the security officer had one job. He did nothing. He called us bitches. He put his hands in our faces. And you said, I'm tired. I'm just going to bed. So, yeah, I, I was tired ask- and had to go to bed because I had to actually physically, physically protect myself in this particular situation. You know, the story is long and exhaustive and we won't get into it today. But there are some white folks that really feel emboldened and either they're going to get themselves harmed really bad or some of us are literally going to lose our lives because I'm not of the turn the other cheek generation. That's not who I am. And I know I need to grow up and I need I have too much to lose and all that stuff that people tell me. But if you get attacked, you get attacked. But if you come into my space, attack us they they attacked us they called us out of our names um belligerent just totally disrespectful violent dangerous i'm gonna fight i'm i'm going to fight i'm from the projects in harlem (laughs) so that people need to understand like you said folk got me fucked up if you run up on me we are going to have a physical altercation i'm not gonna let people harm me I'm just not going to do it. And I get it. Oh, well, you know, you got to walk away. Why no. do we have to keep walking away? No. That was the whole thing. The, 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 in this bar where we were, which, by the way, 
We weren't even we weren't even in the bar to have a good time. I was literally studying scripture for a speech that I had to give the next day at jo- Jamal Bryant's church at New Birth in Atlanta. I was literally working with the pastor. I had called her and said, could you meet me downstairs for just 30 minutes so that you and I could look at my message because I'm a little stuck around the ending and I want to make sure I'm on the right track. So she says, okay, let's go downstairs and meet. We sit there, order one drink, we're working on it. And a white man comes and starts menacing myself, my family member who was there, and other black women who were sitting at the bar. I have a text message from the black woman who we did not know that was sitting there. The way that he was bothering her, she texted me and said, I appreciate the fact that you stood up to him. Because nobody else, the security was doing absolutely nothing. And this is a constant problem. I hear black people, black women, especially Mm -hmm, talking about mm -hmm. all the time being disrespected and violated um, by white folks, white women and men. And and, 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 and what the the whole thing was, well, because, you know, I got my, well, Tamika, you know, you should just walk away or you should have just left the bar. Why do I have to inconvenience myself so that he could sit there and and, and feel and and be comfortable? We're not doing that. And if you don't speak right. up in that situation, then you make it harder for the next black person because then now that guy or woman thinks that behavior is cool and they will continue to do that to other black people. What I, promise y'all, what I promise y'all is that him and his wife now know the next time they see some black women, they're going to go in the opposite direction. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I, that's what is I'm going to promise you. Is there a video? Well, they, yeah, I'm sure people would tape it. And there's, okay. there's cameras. And, and, and it right. is what it is. I get it. I, there's another video that's online of um, my son and me and, and I think uh, Angelo in uh, Staten Island where I caught this woman or a young girl, whatever she was, taking pictures of my license plate. Right. People don't. And, and, and what I saw, the commentary online, because you see us fighting, you see us getting ready to get into a serious altercation. And my mouth is I'm a black woman. I can curse better than anybody in the mm-hmm. world. You want to go into a cursing fight with me, I could put words together. Mm-hmm. So you you hear me in the video cursing these people out. And the commentary from folks was like, yeah, but y'all only showing us what happened when they got upset. Why are you not showing us how this all started? So I didn't even worry about it because I know what happened. She was taking pictures of my license plate, and I went over and asked her why. What you going? You just going to let somebody take pictures of your license? Maybe you do that, but I, where I come from, that's, right. that's right. a problem because your license plate, if you got some tickets, can be tracked to your address. You know, that's serious. So I went over and asked her why, and she looked at me and was like, because I feel like it. So, Damn. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I don't even need to say anything yeah. else. That's what happened. So that's why you see us in a situation. Yeah. And by the way, we on the streets. We are outside. in Front in, lines. In, in, This is called uh, contact, right? We're in contact with other individuals. We're not on the computer in the house doing YouTube videos That's telling right. people to like and share and subscribe. That's not what we do. That's right. We walk outside onto the streets. Anything can happen. And if people get the impression that you playing or you afraid or you you know you would back down, do you realize do you know you we fooled probably out be here. dead. You fooled out here. Yeah, no, nah, I'm not we ain't with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know my son ain't with it. Absolutely. At all. And he he literally be trying to de escalate all the time. He works so hard the other night to try to make sure that this incident did not go any further <laughs> and sure enough it just didn't work out Word. all right we just want to make sure we don't have a wrong narrative out there Absolutely. You know? i don't care what the narrative is i'm gonna spin it don't <laughs> even worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> don't even worry about it tamika mallory state of emergency how to win in the country we built is available everywhere now That's right, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you are a leader tamika i'm happy that you exist i'm happy to be a part of this this journey with you on your on your first book. First book. Because it won't be the last. No, because we have another book. Hey, man. We got a publishing company. We do. This is our publishing we company. Did. So uh, our. Our book, right. our publishing company. That's right. I love you, Yee. I love you too. You know that, Tamika. Now listen, you're gonna be on virtual book tours all week. I hate that you gotta do virtual book I tours. Know. Hopefully it's only for a week or two and then you can get on the road. Well, actually, it's kind of good that it's virtual because I don't know if we would have been able to get Kendrick Sampson and, mm. you know, Jeezy and and um tonight we have Taraji P. Henson as a part of the tour. Yep. You know, we got Tiffany Haddish on the tour. Mm-hmm. So those people probably would not have been able to do the dates. If it weren't for the fact that, you know, it's virtual, so they could just pop on a Zoom, mm-hmm. you know. But you're, you're hosting one tonight. Um, yes, for the Scranton Bookstore. Yep. 
I don't know how to tell people to sign up, though. I know you got to go buy oh, a no. ticket. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I can tell them. They can click the link in your no. bio? Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> no, they, actually, they can go to TamikaDMallory.com, TamikaDMallory.com, and you can purchase tickets to any city. The cities are not specific. We just, okay. We're just we working with local bookstores in those cities, and therefore, we needed to make sure you know that, that they get the credit for their p- local community. But uh, the tour, you can buy a ticket to any one of them that you would like to attend. There's a lot of powerful people that are on the tour. You got activists, you know, organizers on the ground, as well as celebrities and, you know, very important thought leaders. So it's a mixture. Michael Eric Dyson is on the tour. Tonight's the kickoff. It's mm-hmm. going to be great for Taraji to be joining us. My son's going to be on, right. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great day. So go to TamikaDMallory.com. Yep. Okay. Get your tickets. It's Tamika Mallory. It's The Breakfast Club. 